Hello, everyone. As Bill Newell would say, I'm Rick Moore, and uh, this is the Salem News Sports Writers Podcast that uh, I love listening to every week. I love listening to these guys. We um, have um, Executive Sports Editor Bill Stacy, the Assistant Sports Editor Matt Williams, and of course, the Sports Editor of the Boston Times, Nick Kukuru. And guys, uh, welcome. Um, I, I got to tell you all while you're there uh, together, um, I told Phil this earlier, I love listening to you guys because every week, we hear so many names, so many statistics, you get so much information and that I, I can't imagine how any parent or kid for that matter would want to miss it. So thanks for doing this, I really appreciate it. Hey, you're welcome. Bill, no, let's start. Um, hey, you're welcome. Or, 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 or. I hear a lot of feedback here. Um, I guess one of the big things, big stories of the week, uh, I've been covering football or, or, or MSO, and a couple of big stories, uh, of course, the, uh, the, the Fenwick uh, St. Mary's game, the Beverly Maskinama game, but the Salem Gloucester game had really big ramifications uh, for both teams. And uh, Phil, do you want to start us off on that? Uh, I, I can, yeah. I mean, Nick was at the game. He'd probably give you a little more insight, but a huge win for Salem, obviously. Not only is it uh, the team's third straight uh, to go to three and one, they haven't been three and one in, in uh, quite a while, but, you know, takes that monkey off their back. They hadn't beaten Gloucester since 1999. Uh, to give you some perspective, uh, Cooks was in high school and uh, Willie, were you a, what, freshman, eighth grader maybe at the time? Uh, yeah, freshman year, yeah, Salem Super Bowl year, yep. Yeah, so, I mean. I was in Rick's Algebra two class that year, if, uh, actually. <laughs> How were you? Okay. Oh, really, were you? <laughs> All right. So that, uh, that gives you some perspective as to how long ago uh, it's been since Salem beat Gloucester. And uh, a lot of those games, as, as uh, Nick again could tell you, were ugly. Uh, 11 shutouts in 18 games uh, since that time. But, you know, Salem's found a way to, to turn it around this season. They're getting a really good defensive play. Um, they're getting some timely offense. They had two uh, – Second half touchdowns the other day, quarterback Michael Reddy, uh, one of the captains, and then Jerry L. Del Vale punches one in on uh, the fourth quarter with Alex Paulino getting the two point conversion. Um, they're getting a great play from their upperclassmen. They're getting some production from the, um, the younger guys like Corey Grimes, sophomore, Rocco Ryan's a freshman who's contributing. So uh, things are going pretty well for Salem, and, and you have to think they have a great shot to keep it going this week when they host uh, Saugus on a Thursday night at Birchfield, Field. Saugus hasn't won a game yet. Salem is feeling great. They're rolling three in a row. So why not make it four in a row for the Witches? Um, they certainly have everything going in their favor. And Coach Matt, Matt Bouchard and his staff have them uh, riding a crest, but also being even keeled week to week. So, hey, let's keep it going if we're Salem. Yeah, I mean, the Witches, they totally earned that one. I mean, they, you know, 15 second half points. They were uh, definitely the better team in the second half of that game. And they made, you know, two big timely stops in the first half, two interceptions that killed, you know, Gloucester's two best drives. Um, the, the Quinn Rock O'Ryan got one of them, and I, I forget who got the other one. It was right before the half. He returned it up to, to midfield. But that was even the, the bigger play because that one was in the red zone. Um, and that was uh, Jean Davis. Uh, Kadeem, yes. Right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what it was. Yep. And um, yeah, I mean, they kind of uh, found a little groove on offense there in the second half. Uh, Michael Reddy, quarterback, was big on those zone reads and they were running a little bit of RPOs. That's what I had the most trouble with. Uh, a few RPOs to uh, to Grimes kind of up the seam, um, get, you know, with the big chunk plays that set up their score. And then, you know, yeah, defensively, uh, you know, they just went to work. Uh, big stop after big stop. Um, they got a nice stop on two point conversion. Gloucester uh, scored. Uh, but unfortunately, their quarterback, uh, Ewan McCarthy, is also their holder, and he separated his shoulder, and uh, their backup holder is their only kid who knows how to snap. So the, the extra point wasn't exactly in the cards, and uh, they went for two, and Salem blew up uh, the fullback trap up the middle. I uh, didn't have a chance uh, ever. And um, then, you know, Gloucester kind of had to let them score on the ensuing drive, but uh, then they couldn't stop the two-point conversion. I think it was Alex Paulino with a, a really nice catch. Um, Reddy rolled right and then just kind of threw a rainbow, you know, across the other side of the field to, to the left uh, corner of the end zone. And uh, Paulino tracked it down with a great catch. And 
that made it a two score game. So that was it. And, uh, you know, yeah, totally a well-earned win for Salem. Uh, as for Gloucester, you know, they're really struggling. I think this, uh, you know, it's going to be a tough one to bounce back from. They got Winthrop coming up this week. That'll be a, a tough test on the road, but you know, it's been turnovers that have killed them six turnovers in the last two weeks. Um, you know, they, they never really got going against Saugus last week. And then it, it might've even cost them against Salem this week uh, with uh, you know, a couple first half interceptions. Well, Although, speaking, you know, you said they go to Winthrop this coming week. Winthrop is coming off of a 42 nothing loss yeah. uh, mm-hmm. at Danvers. And I realize Danvers is in another uh, a, a step up, let's say, from uh, Salem and Gloucester and Winthrop. But, um, you know, maybe it's one of those cases like, hey, they're, they're licking their wounds. Uh, maybe Gloucester can catch them. Uh, by surprise. I mean, you, you never know, I suppose, but uh, they almost did last season. That was probably Gloucester's best performance was against, you know, it was a 27, 20 loss to Winthrop. That was a really good Winthrop team last year. But so, yeah, I mean, maybe they catch them by surprise again. Uh, you know, this week, put in, you know, another one of their better performances. And I, I enjoyed your, uh, your story on the uh, Peabody Marblehead game. I was there for that one and you described it so accurately, uh, almost a tale of two, two, two halves there because Peabody almost came back. But what are your thoughts on that one? Well, I just think, uh, you know, from Peabody's perspective, they played a lot better defensively, right? I mean, they tackled, uh, you know, the two touchdown uh, run uh, passes that they gave up were both, uh, you know, just, just bad coverage, uh, you know, blown coverage, right? Nobody there. It wasn't a physical mistake. I mean, if they had played uh, physically, defensively uh, the way they did against Marblehead against Masco and Beverly, you know, maybe they split those two games and, and win one of them. Uh, both the touchdown passes Marblehead had them beat before the ball was ever snapped, you know, and, and I think that is a credit to Marblehead. And that's one thing that gets overlooked with them a lot. You know, Mike, Mike Giardi has been running that spread offense now for gosh, close to seven or eight years. And so he has all the tricks. And he's been working with Josh Robertson for, for this is their third year together now. So, you know, they, uh, with the, the chess pieces, they can move around. They have you beat before the snap. And, and I've just, I've seen it so many times. I had a chance because of the fall two schedule to watch Marblehead a couple times last year, more than I normally do. And, and seeing him this year, I mean, that's just what they do. I've seen him do it to so many people. And, you know, it really occurred to me this weekend that, the reason why Danvers is the one team that always keeps it close with Marblehead is because Danvers is the one team that you will never beat on a play before the ball is snapped. That that's what it is. Um, you know, so that was really my biggest takeaway. The two biggest plays in the game were, were just gay, you know, plays that were made really before, before the play even started. And, you know, other than that, I mean, you just, it, BBD cannot continue to fumble the ball. I mean, you lose three fumbles, against a team like Marblehead, you're not going to win. They, they lost three against Beverly. They lost two against Masco. I mean, that's, what, seven lost fumbles. That's why you're on a three-game losing streak. So, I mean, the quarterback's throwing the ball an average of 33 times a game. He has one interception the whole season, and it was a tip ball. So, I mean, when you're a passing offense and your quarterback's taking care of the ball, you, you can't be putting the ball on the ground. Where, you know, you're going to run the ball 10 times a game and, and, and average three fumbles. I mean, that's just – it can't happen. So, you know, they, they got to take care of the ball, but um, Marblehead offensively is just so impressive with, with the way they can create mismatches with their formations and move people around and, and, you know, use different formations to just create mismatches all over the place. I mean, you know, uh, trips, uh, you know, quads, I mean, uh, you know, tight end to either side. Uh, sometimes they go empty. I mean, just, just, it's, it's a lot, and, and they know their experience. They know how to take advantage of, of getting the defense in, in places where where they don't go, and, and there just aren't that many defensive coordinators with the experience to either recognize it, get out of those calls, you know, get the timeout when they need it. And you got to remember we're dealing with high school kids here too, so they don't always recognize those adjustments right away. They, they freeze. I mean, it's, it's not the NFL, but – Marblehead's offense is sort of operating at that at that next level that that sort of uh, you know graduate level courses as opposed to undergrad stuff if that makes sense. Willie, what are they doing defensively to, to clean things up? I mean, they've given up 125 points in the last three games. I mean, something has to be done. I don't know if it's um, uh, 
I don't know if it's a question of stacking the box more, dropping more guys back into coverage. I mean, what's going on there? Well, it's just a simple matter of tackling. And like I said, I mean, I think, uh, you know, they, they allowed Marblehead, which is the best team around, half the yardage that they allowed to Masco and Beverly. So I think those point totals are misleading, at least for Marblehead. I mean, you know, they gave them two or three 30-odd yard fields, courtesy of the fumbles, right? So, I mean, I think when you look at the total yardage, you know, they certainly cut that down against the superior team, right? So that's a good thing. Uh, it's really just a matter of tackling, you know, you just can't lunge at people, can't miss people. And, uh, you, you just have to wrap up. I mean, it's as simple as that really. I mean, you go against two running teams and you don't tackle those teams are going to run for a lot of yards. I mean, I, it's not rocket science. You know, we were just talking about the Marblehead graduate level defense, right? PBD doesn't need a graduate level defense that they, they need basics. They, they just need to tackle the guys that are in front of them. And, and if they can do that, then they're going to be fine. I mean, I look at this game with Swampskit, and it's very interesting the way the schedules are inverted, right? I mean, Swampskit, with all due respect to their opponents so far, hasn't really played anybody. Peabody has played, you know, most of the tough teams. So you, you could flip their schedules and, and see their records being flipped. I think this is a very even game on paper and, and one that sets up a, a, to really potentially start the playoff chase for both of these teams. I mean, if Swampskit wins... They go into that NEC North, you know, Cornelius run with all sorts of confidence. If Peabody wins, that can send them on a run that maybe puts them in the playoffs. So I, I think it's a, a really sneaky big game. I mean, you look, oh, you got a 4-0 team against a 1-3 and team, right? Like, this doesn't look like much of a game. But when you look at the schedules that they've played, it, it becomes very interesting. I think it's very even on paper, and there's just – you know, both teams have so many skilled guys on the outside that are going to be able to match up one-on-one, -on -one, and it's going to be a matter of who wins those matchups. And that's really fascinating because I think, you know, athletically, in terms of the outside receivers and cornerbacks, uh, both teams have have two of the deepest groups in the NEC. So so watching them match up uh, should be really interesting, you know, because because Swampskit really has flown under the radar a little bit, I think, these last two years. I mean, you know, they they – they've really in the last two years have only played one team Marblehead that was any good and, and, you know, got blown out of the water. Right. So I think people have kind of forgotten about them a little bit. I, I think they're still a pretty good football team uh, and they've been cruising along. You, you know, the question is just, uh, you know, how are they going to respond if they face a little bit of adversity and, and things like that? And, and, you know, I mean, I, I'm not like disparaging swamps get this is just the way the schedule worked out. I think, you know, both teams, if they had their druthers, would have rather had maybe the tough games and the easy games, so to speak, uh, kind of mixed together rather than, you know, these kind of streaks of, well, here's this really tough part and here's this maybe lesser tough part, you know? Well, what about um, your game? Um, sounded like a beauty. Um, tell me about that one. You had um, Beverly and Masco? Yeah, yeah, and that's a uh, that's a good segue with uh, you know Willie talking about Marblehead. Of course, they're going to Maskin on it this week. Both those teams are, are four and zero, so that should be an interesting uh, matchup there, especially with Marblehead having defeated Masco twice during the fall two season. Um, I know from talking to some of the Masco guys after the game that they are eager to uh, try to turn that around this coming weekend. Of course, much easier said than done against. Marblehead, they've been uh, laying waste to teams uh, in this fall, and certainly did they did back in the spring too. But as for last week's game against uh, Beverly, yeah, it was a great game, back and forth, uh, one point game. Obviously, as you saw by the final score, 26-25, with Masco scoring the game-winning touchdown with 40 seconds left. Sam Nadworthy, uh, sophomore, goes in um, off tackle from seven yards out to give them the win. Um, Masking on it's tough. You know, they, they run the ball uh, extremely effectively behind the, the two brothers, Matt and Sam Nadworthy. I think they combined the other day for almost 260 yards rushing between the two of them. And it's nothing that uh, you don't see a lot of high school teams run. It's a buck sweep. It's the, the toss. It's power. Uh, you know, they're, they're occasional jet in there and whatnot. But I think uh, really a big key for them is the guys on that uh, offensive line. Um, you know, you have Will Magnifico, he's a captain. Danny Ganji's a captain up front. Uh, Jeff Papalato, Hayden Canada Hunt. Uh, 
Tyler McMahon's a tight end there. Uh, Albie Levita is one of the linemen. Uh, Eric Sivach is another lineman. And, you know, with Matt Richardson as the quarterback, he's another veteran guy back there that knows what he's doing, knows how to move the offense. But I think the line is really key for the success of those guys. Uh, I mentioned the two Nadworthies. You also got Rich Carino, who's another change of pace back they have. Owen Barrett's kind of their main receiver at split end. Uh, they got a lot going on there. Toll Lodwick is another guy who can uh, catch passes out of that backfield. So that, to me, is what uh, where the strength of Maskinama lies offensively. Um, you know, Beverly was missing arguably their best player the other day, um, Captain Jody Irvine. He had to sit out a game after uh, being tossed. But what, what did they term that, Willie? An illegal hit in that game against Peabody or a hit to uh, the head? Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I don't, yeah, I've asked a, a bunch of people about that and I haven't gotten an exact straight answer uh, as to what's automatic suspension and what's reviewable. Yeah. And because I was under the impression that it was reviewable, like it is in hockey uh, for a five minute major that, that comes with the suspension, you know, but I guess that wasn't the case. So uh, I think for our viewers, the easiest way to explain it is like the college football targeting rule which we've all seen some hits in college football that they eject players for that we say, well, that really wasn't so bad. Uh, I think it falls under that notion. I've talked to a lot of coaches, you know, that neither involved with either Peabody or Beverly that all kind of said, well, it looked to me like a 15 yard foul that didn't require any extra discipline. So that, that seemed to be the prevailing notion from the folks that I talked to. So it's a definitely tough break for Beverly there. Yeah, and, and I talked to some Beverly people who thought, you know, they could see it from both sides, but it wasn't really reviewable as far as MIA guidelines go. I mean, those are the kind of things that you got to do like almost right away. And they meet, I think, on Tuesdays, and they review it, and they make a decision. So um, anyway, it didn't work out. He didn't play. But geez, you know what? There were some guys that really stepped up in his stead. Um, Gabe Copeland. Uh, junior, who's, you know, we talked about this, I think, in the podcast before, kind of no, more known on the basketball court. He's really just kind of feeling his way around the football gridiron, learning uh, to play uh, kind of an interesting combination. He's a nose tackle defensively. He's a running back offensively. You don't see that too often. Um, but he had a 77-yard touchdown run. He finished with over 100 yards. And then Andre Sullivan ran well. Pierce Heim, the quarterback, uh, first two touchdown game for him through a couple of Nice touchdown passes, 27 yard to Devin Smalls to give Beverly the lead late. He also hit, uh, oh, geez, who else did he hit for a touchdown? I can't remember off the top of my head. Zach was Sparks it Manny was or? No, was it was um, Manny uh, Hernandez. No, it was Zach Sparkman. Da, yeah, okay, touchdown. gotcha. Um, they got some inspired uh, defensive plays. Well, what I liked ab about Beverly, if I'm Beverly and I'm trying to take positives out of that game, I thought when Maskinom had had a close to nine minute drive in the third quarter and they, that offensive line that I mentioned uh, for my, for our Maskinom, excuse me, really were leaning on Beverly and you could see Beverly get tired and Maskinom at this point is starting to impose their will a little bit and they score at the end of this drive. They take the lead. I think Beverly's on the road. You play on grass, which is, you know, an unfamiliar surface for a lot of people. Although Beverly does play at herd, but, um, you know, they're, they're minus their best player, arguably. And they came back and they scored on their very next possession, touchdown to retake the lead, got that momentum back. So for Coach Jeff Hutton and his team, which is still learning a new offense, still working with a new coaching system, still trying to, you know, put the right pieces into the right places. I think that's that's a positive to find out of a difficult loss. Um, I think uh, the Beverly side feels like it's a game they very uh, easily could have won or could have been reversed, and that they could be three and one. So they go into this week against Danvers, and kind of a neat thing, they are bringing in portable lights to Beverly High School. They're going to play a game on the turf at 40 Field this Friday night against Danvers, a Danvers game, team that is, as always, really, really good. Um, and... Cooks, I think you mentioned last week how you thought that their early schedule was not going to benefit them in terms of the playoffs. But, boy, they've, they've, uh, they've proven all of us wrong there. They're 3-1 and one coming in after whipping Winthrop. And, I mean, they got to be favored over a Beverly team that's 2-2. Two and two. 
they always seem to get the absolute most out of what they have. So another really, really tough test for Beverly this week. I mean, it's like Coach Jeff Hutton was saying to me after the game. He says, you know, geez, we just had a one-point game against a team that's undefeated in our league and has uh, beaten some great teams, and it just doesn't get easier. We go Danvers, we go Swampscott, we go Marblehead after this. So it's just, it's just a gauntlet of teams that you have to go through. Uh, in the Northeastern Conference, which, you know, for us on the outside is great, seeing great games every week. But for the coaches that have to game plan and for the players that have to go uh, through these actual battles, it is very difficult week to week. Nick, I wonder if I could maybe ask you uh, a little bit about Cape Ann in general, uh, you know, what you're seeing maybe with other sports or, or Manchester Six football, what comes to mind? Yeah, I was saying Manchester Essex football. I mean, they got a huge one coming up this uh, Saturday. It might be, you know, for one of the top uh, top billing in the Commonwealth Conference uh, at Kip at Manning Field on Saturday, uh, 4 p.m. game. But yeah, I mean, Manchester Essex is uh, is hitting on all cylinders right now. They pounded on Cathedral, which I, I thought was going to be a good game. Cathedral come in looking good, uh, looking like a high powered offense, and you know that Manchester Essex defense shut them down. It was a uh, 43 to 14 final, but it was 43 to nothing in the fourth quarter. So Manchester Essex really had their way. I mean, it was the same, you know, the same group of guys again, Brendan Twombly quarterback. Uh, I mean, he's up to 12 touchdown passes now in four games. He's just been lighting it up. Uh, AJ Palazzola is their leading receiver. And uh, we saw Cameron Hubbard, who's a sophomore running back. He's kind of been, uh, he was a little banged up early on. They unleashed him this week. He had a big 50 yard touchdown run. He had a nice touchdown reception. Uh, I think he actually had two touchdown runs and a touchdown reception. So there's another weapon to, to add to that list. So they're, they're looking good. Uh, and, and that game against Kip's going to be, and that's not only uh, uh, for the Commonwealth, but that could be a division eight playoff preview. I think that's two of the better teams uh, in division eight. So they, they might meet again somewhere down the line. Um, yeah. And as for the rest of Cape Ann, I mean, you got to highlight, uh, Gloucester Golf is 13 and 0, uh, which is huge for them. Uh, they got a ton of depth this season. Uh, they were actually supposed to play Monday afternoon. That one got rained out. That was going to be probably that. I think Beverly's undefeated too, right? That would have been the, the top two teams in the NEC so far, right there. But uh, you know, Gloucester Golf's just getting it done. They had uh, they won four matches this week. Two over Marblehead, who was one of the you know one of the tougher teams in the in the NEC as well. Um, you had Jack Costanzo at the top of the lineup. I know we all know him more so for hockey and baseball, but uh, shot two under par rounds at Bass Rocks last week uh, to help them out. Jack Delaney at the number two spot uh, has also been good. And, you know, really the end of their lineup, uh, Coach Tyler Coniglieri says he's used 13 different kids uh, in the lineup this season. And, and, and that's where they're really picking up their wins is their, their five through eight is just not much different than their one through four. And it's almost too much for uh, – you know, some of these teams to handle depth wise. And that's where they really, uh, you know, racking up the wins, but, um, you know, that's going to be a big test against Beverly this week. I know it was Beverly. Is it Aiden LeBlanc, the, the their stud player, one of the best in, yeah. Uh, yeah, he's probably the best in the conference. Yeah. So he's, he might be the, the player to be. So we'll see if, uh, you know, Beverly's top, you know, guns come out or Gloucester's depth comes out. It's a pretty, uh, intriguing matchup in the match play format. Nice. Matt, what about you? Uh, what else catches your eye? Well, I think, um, you know, the, the, the soccer scene's been been pretty fun. I mean, we got to shout out Bishop Fenwick. Uh, they beat Bishop Fian on Friday, and uh, Fian was the only team that beat them last year, beat them twice. Fian was a Division One state champion in 2019. They, they went unbeaten in 2020. They were ranked number one in New England and, and number four in the country by the uh, United Soccer Coaches Association. So you go on the road, you shut out, uh, you know, ostensibly one of the top teams in the whole country, certainly in New England. That's a pretty uh, nice win for Bishop Fenwick and their phenomenal keeper, Claudia Keith. Uh, you, you know, they, they've only given up one goal all season so far in, in about eight games. So that's uh, – that that's pretty good defensively for uh, for the Crusaders, you know. And I know that win was a long time coming for them, you know, because Fian having joined the CCL just last year, and you know they they took them to penalty kicks in that CCL Cup final that felt like a state final last year amid all that pandemic stuff. So uh, for Fenwick to finally beat them, uh, and considering the lofty ranking they had, I mean that's uh, that's an incredible accomplishment there for Fenwick. Oh. Yeah, I can check in with some of the um, field hockey information here if you want. We get some teams certainly playing well. We're finally going to get that Danvers-Masco uh, game, which should be a, a 
Battle of Unbeatens when it's played this Saturday. You have the defending champ Masco going against the 2019 champ Masco, both undefeated in the conference. Um, you know, they obviously have games this week with Danvers playing um, Swampscott Monday and then Marblehead on Wednesday leading up to the game and masking on it with a pair of games of its own where they're going to take on um, Peabody and Gloucester before uh, playing at Danvers Saturday. But shapes up to be a great matchup. You know, of course, uh, you talk Masco, you got to start with Maggie Sturgis. She's got an amazing 22 goals in, uh, in just seven games. For she's averaging over three goals a game for the Chieftains. Uh, you know, Lily Conway's got 10 points, Ava Teller's got four goals and seven points, uh, Kenzie Carey, uh, Ali Baker, Julia Graves, Riley Trodden, uh, the goalie Ainsley Grunier, all uh, you know, outstanding players that make um, Maggie Briggio's team click the way that it does. And you know, on the other side, Danvers, Kristen McCarthy, first year coach, she's kept that program uh, rolling right along from Jill McGinnity. Lots of balance scoring over there with uh, the captain, Grace Brinkley, uh, Catherine Purcell, uh, Emma Wilichowski. They all have uh, eight, nine points, that area. Uh, sophomore Bobby Serino starting to pick it up. She had a nice two goal game against uh, Bishop, previously unbeaten Bishop Fenwick last week. Uh, Abby Scher, Milana Moy, uh, the Osceolo twins uh, played very well, Sabrina and, and Lauren. Uh, cousin Sadie and Sophie Papamichael defensively. Megan McGinnity, sophomore goalie, eight shutouts in nine games for Fenwick. Uh, she's only given up two goals the entire season. So something's got to give when those two teams play Saturday, 12.30 at Danvers. Uh, I'm looking forward to catching that game. And I think uh, in terms of local field hockey, it'll be a marquee matchup with a lot of people interested in that. Well, I, I just have one question about um, the new um, naming, the, the new names involved in uh... – Northeastern Conference. I'm very familiar, for, of course, with Dick Lynch, but I didn't know about Cornelius Dunn. How did the um, uh, who decided um, how this thing was going to go? In other words, uh, was it the agencies with the administrators? And the, there were other names bandied about, I'm sure, but these two guys came out on top. Yeah, I think uh, the conference ads have been kicking this around for a few years, to be honest with you. And um, you know, certainly had they had some more pressing issues last year to deal with, but. Uh, when it came back around this year, uh, you know, they decided like, okay, let's let's nominate some names here. Let's see if we can come to a consensus and we'll vote for things and all. And, um, you know, they, they wanted to uh, throw out names of people that were uh, heavily influential in the conference, you know, in, in one form or another, you know, whether it was, and I'm spitballing here, but I'm guessing say like, you know, maybe there were former players like a Mike Ruzioni whose name was thrown out. Or maybe it was somebody like a Lorraine Benoit who had a, you know, hugely impactful um, career, not only at PBD High, but she was right at the forefront of Title IX back in the early 70s, um, all the way through. Barb, uh, Barb Damon would, be, would have been another great one. Barb Damon, yeah, is another one. Um, so th I think there were a lot of names and they knocked those down to maybe a, a half dozen or maybe even fewer and then voted back and forth. And, um, you know, as you said, Dick Lynch, I think is a name that, that many, many people know, and that's a great choice, but Connie Dunn is a guy who started the conference. I mean, he's an administrator who said, you know what? He, he asks the other schools in the area, come to Danvers. We want to create our own sports league um, for basketball and football or baseball. And, uh, you know, there were some schools that came, decided they want to go. They drew up bylaws and whatnot. Guy's a 40-year principal of the old Holton High School in Danvers, uh, which, you know, became Danvers High. And, uh, you know, he presided over the Northeastern Conference for, for you know, wh whatever it was, 30 years or so. So that, to me, seemed like a no-brainer along with Dick Lynch. I think they have two excellent representatives there. Um, I know from uh, Mike Lynch that his family is thrilled that his father is being remembered that way as I'm sure um, Cornelius Dunn's, um, you know, legacy would be as well. So, hey, it's nice for the conference to have that. You know, the Cape Bain League has had the, uh, the Sherm Kinney and the Dick Baker divisions for a couple of years. So uh, I think it was only natural and fitting for the Northeastern Conference to do the same thing. And um, two excellent choices from, uh, from this perch. Thanks, thanks. Yeah, it was, it was a good story. And uh, as I said, I didn't know about uh, 
Well done. All right, before we wrap this up, I'm going to ask you guys now to promote stuff that's coming up this week uh, so people will go out and buy the Salem News and they'll also look on the website so that we get some credit for these videos as well. Nick, we'll start with you. What's, uh, what's the general agenda this week? Yeah, well, uh, we were going to have a nice golf match and uh, some soccer coverage for today, but that's all rained out. But, uh, you know, Gloucester Boys Soccer's got Mask and Omit tomorrow. That should be a pretty interesting NEC crossover game. Um, we also have, I don't even remember what else we're doing this week. Well, I know. I mean, you're, you're in it's so many different places. On Wednesday. I don't know why it's, it's not coming. That's an right. unfair question. Yeah, I, I know. It's something on Wednesday and Thursday, too. I just. Uh, <laughs> okay. All right. We'll get the paper and we'll, we'll find out. Exactly. Matt, what's, uh, what's coming up? Well, I think, uh, you know, you can always look back and always look forward, right? That's sort of what we do. Uh, you know, we're, we're going to have our weekly hidden gem feature, of course. Yeah. Uh, you know, your scoring leaders for football, all your points uh, scored. You could have one point or or you could be leading the area with 50 and, and your name gets in there. Uh, you know, obviously, as, as the week gets uh, closer to Friday night, we'll start looking forward to, to those games that we touched on earlier. Some real big ones. Uh with some championship implications, certainly that Marblehead Masco game has, uh, you know, and some good Saturday takes too. I mean, Pingree is going to play Tilton. That's a good one. Uh, we'll, we'll have that for you. And, uh, you know, obviously I think this week uh, column wise, it is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, both soccer columns this week. So boys yeah. and girls will we'll have our leaders in the area uh, for goal scoring and, and shout outs for that. And, uh, you know, obviously, uh, uh, if time allows, we might sprinkle in some stuff about those Red Sox. I don't know. It's uh, really interesting to think about a, a Red Sox-Yankee uh, playoff game that doesn't have the same kind of buzz that you would have seen in uh, 1978 or, or 2004. That's for sure. Mm. I, 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 have to, I have to remind everyone, too, the Gloucester Times will also have those area leaders, which Phil and Willie must be happy to hear. So, you know, Cape Ann parents can stop chirping them on social media and other <laughs> <laughs> Places uh, where we're leaving Gloucester out of the NEC rankings for when it's not just the NEC rankings. But I finally uh, got it together and put some, you know, stats together. So also some Cape Ann names to add to those North Shore names uh, this fall as well. Beautiful, beautiful. You, you know, just speaking quickly about the Red Sox and Yankees, I heard on the radio this morning, I was taking my kids to school and um, heard that the prices are just outrageous. And there's still a bunch of seats available, but well, you think about it, it's like a Tuesday night game, not a lot of notice. I mean, granted, it is what it is, but people coming off the euphoria of, you know, Patriots, Brady last night or whatever. And, you know, they're asking $300 regular, regular price. This isn't like inflated, you know, prices here. Regular price, $300 for like upper bleacher seats. Like, no thanks. I'm not doing that. No. I remember $2. Yeah, three, three bucks here, I can remember. Okay, so, yikes. Playoffs, you know, that's why they invented a, you know, Raython tube and a television set. I'm happy there. Into that. <laughs> all right, boys, it's been fun. Bill Newell will be back next week. And on behalf of all these guys, I'm Rick Moore. This is MSO News Sports. Thank you.